Council here at UCL, and a particularly warm welcome to the Commission of the Group, to his colleagues, and to so many from uh, particularly the new embassies uh, in London. And I hope you will forgive me if I single out uh, Edith Gouvois, the new Belgian ambassador, because uh, in another corner of the uh, universe, I happily co-chair the Belgo-British Conference, I co-chair being one of these distinguished uh, former colleagues in London, Louis Willems. So it's a double pleasure to welcome Commissioner uh, de Gouche, who has just embarked on his fifth year as Trade Commissioner for the European Union, having had before that a distinguished career in the European Commission in Belgian politics, uh, and including five years as Belgium's uh, Foreign Minister. When I was in Brussels for five years in the late 1990s as the UK's permanent representative to the European Union, Carol de Gouche was a member of the European uh, Parliament, and I'm sure he will remember, as I do, that although a lot of time was spent on negotiating treaties, Amsterdam and Nice in particular, uh, some of the dominant <coughs> themes of that period were actually trade issues. And I will briefly mention three of them because I think they are illustrative. Uh, the first is bananas. Uh, and everybody <laughs>, laughs when you say bananas, but in fact it was one of the major disputes between the European Union and the producer countries of Latin America, or more precisely, the United States, whose companies owned most of the production in Latin America. And the EU was taken to the WTO by the United States and the Latin Americans uh, and lost because of the privileged uh, trade that we allowed to the banana producers of the African, Caribbean, and Pacific. And for some of those countries, uh, the Windward Islands, for example, uh, in the Caribbean, their prime ministers would say very openly that there are two things that we can produce uh, on our islands. One is bananas and the other is drugs, and we would rather be producing uh, uh, bananas. When the Americans won in the WTO, they had, under WTO rules, the right to retaliate. And one of the industries against which they decided to retaliate was the cashmere industry in Scotland. And the leaders of the cashmere industry went to see the US Consul General in Edinburgh to say, if you retaliate again, if you target our industry, you will put us out of business. And the American Consul General said, I am pleased that you have understood what we are intending to do. <laughs> now, had it not been for the power of the European Union, versus the United States, that eventually an accommodation was reached. If it had just been Britain uh, in that situation, let alone just Scotland in that situation, there might have been a very different outcome and the Kashmir industry might indeed have gone to, uh, uh, to the war. The second example is almost the mirror image of that, and that is when the United States decided to uh, take action against US steel imports into the United States, against EU steel imports into the United States on the grounds that we were dumping. Now, in fact, we, as we all know, very, with great, great pain across the EU, had reformed our steel industry. The Americans uh, hadn't, and dumping it wasn't. But what changed American minds was not just the fact that we won the case, that the EU won the case, but American car producers in particular were urging their government not to target EU steel, partly because they depended on it, and partly because they were afraid that under retaliation, uh, their industry uh, would have suffered. My third and final example is a very different one, which was an EU negotiation with South Africa. South Africa, Nelson Mandela had been received and fated at a European Council under Tony Blair's chairmanship in Cardiff, and you would have thought that the one thing that we would all want to do was make a trade agreement with South Africa. Uh, the Commission skillfully negotiated a deal which was brilliant from the EU point of view, and it was held up for month after month after month because the Italians on the one hand and the Portuguese government on the other objected to the fact that there was a group of people of Italian descent in South Africa producing something they still wanted to call grappa, and there was a group of people of Portuguese descent in South Africa producing something they still wanted to call port wine. And a combination of things uh, eventually led to this impasse being broken. One was pressure on those two countries from their partners, and the other, uh, I'm sorry to say, but it was effective, was pressure from the European Commission on behalf of the Italians and the Portuguese to get the South Africans to, uh, to back down. So those are three illustrations of something which I think is an important fact about the European Union, which is of all the policies which derive from the original Treaty of Rome, <coughs> common agricultural policy, competition policy, trade policy, the first is self-evidently controversial. Competition policy, I sometimes think that if you asked member states today to concede competence over competition policy, you would not get the agreement of the member states to do so. But of those three, trade policy, remains one of the most important and one of the least controversial in its detail, certainly, but in principle, least controversial. Uh, and on that note, it's my great pleasure to give the floor to Commissioner de Gouche to tell us about the current situation uh, about the EU and trade policy. Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
morning, uh, ambassadors, Madam Dean, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, dear students. Um, John Maynard Keynes' portraits of uh, an upper-class Londoner at the turn of the last century is still fascinating today. He, I quote, could order by telephone, sipping his morning tea in bed, the various products of the whole earth, and at the same moment, and by the same means, adventure his wealth in the natural resources and new enterprises of any quarter of the world. Typical Londoners in 2014 are even more connected than their predecessors, and not just because they can do their shopping or investing over the internet, from their smartphone, wherever they happen to be, but uh, world trade that was at 16% of world GDP in 1915. Today, goods and services exports amount to more than double that percentage, to say nothing of the vast stocks and flows of foreign direct investment. A hundred years ago, most consumer goods were produced in one country. Today, the vast majority of the products you use every day, whether it's your phone, or the train, or the underground, incorporate components and services delivered by workers all over the place, all over the world. And what is more, our wave of globalization benefits many more people over much more of the world than the first wave that Keynes was describing. Almost a billion people across the developing world have left poverty behind in the last 20 years, in large part because the labor and the supply can now be connected to demands in other parts of the world. Their uh, improved economic prospects have also shifted the balance of global economic power to the east and the south and brought tougher competition to the doors of companies in the north and the west. Even if they come with such significant benefits, adapting to changes like these is not easy. Writing in 1919, Keynes was in fact mourning the passing of that first period of globalism. He was criticizing a post-war peace uh, settlement that had neglected the economic and political importance of trade between European countries. <coughs> in fact, international trade would only really recover three decades later, after a second global conflict that convinced the Western European nations that uh, open markets were essential to peace and prosperity. So finding the right response to the changes that our world is facing today is just as important as it was 100 years ago. Technology will remain a forceful driver of trade and investment flows, but governments can hold globalization if they resort to protectionism. The United Kingdom's role in the European Union's common commercial policy is part of that response. And that is what I would like to speak about with you today. Europe's uh, global goal on trade is to make globalization work for people here in the UK and across our continent. We want to sell our products and services in large and growing markets around the world. We want to have access to high quality components and raw materials. Through both of these mechanisms, we want to create jobs for European workers. And we want to help people a second time as consumers by giving them a wide choice of products and services at good prices. Finally, we want to help set the global rules of the game on issues like the environment, health and safety and labor rights. The EU translates these objectives into concrete results for British business, workers and consumers. Just to name some of our recent achievements since this European Commission took office four years ago. We have put broad and comprehensive free trade agreements with Korea, Colombia, Peru, Central America into effect. We have concluded negotiations on agreements with Singapore and Canada. And last December, we helped reach the first new multilateral trade agreement since the founding of the World Trade Organization back in 1996. These achievements are part of a wider program 
that will remove barriers on two-thirds of our overall trade. It includes negotiations with emerging economies like Vietnam, Thailand and India, as well as our developed partners in Japan and the US. It also uh, includes uh, negotiations on the rest of the WTO's agenda, including on issues like trade in services, environmental goods, and information technology equipment. The reason EU trade policy is effective is very simple. It's the size of the single market. Taken together, Europe is the largest economy in the world, representing a fifth of all global output. In trade terms, that makes us the largest export market for some 80 countries and the second largest for another 40. For all of those economies, access to the European market is not an option, it is essential. And that puts us in a position of strength in trade negotiations. It means countries are willing to negotiate with us, to open their markets to our exports, and in many cases, to tighten their rules to protect the environment, consumers, health, and labor. None of the countries that Eurosceptics uh, give as examples of what an independent UK trade policy would look like has that kind of influence. Not Switzerland, not Australia. They have uh, made trade agreements, but they do not have Europe's weight when it comes to effective market opening or protecting our values. The same would be the case if Britain chose to go it alone. Within Europe, we can speak uh, about big countries and small countries. In global terms, all European countries are small. And they are getting smaller. In the year 2000, three of the five biggest economies in the world were European, including the UK. In 2010, there were only two, Germany and France. And even if today the UK is the fastest growing of the three big EU players, economists expect that by 2030, none of them will be in the top five unless, that is, Europe sticks together. Because taken together, the EU would remain in a comfortable second place right out to 2050, based on the same projections. So a common commercial policy is the way Europe and the UK, through it, can influence the changing world in the years ahead. Ladies and gentlemen, Dear students, that is a general case for EU trade policy. But let me illustrate it with an example, the transatlantic trade and investment partnership with the United States. One thing uh, should be clear from the outset. This agreement is only feasible because of the Un European Union's common approach to trade. The European Union's trade negotiators are the only ones that can deal with the United States as equals because of our scale. And the US is interested in these negotiations because of the scale of the single market. The benefits of this agreement will be twofold, direct economic gains and a strategic improvement in our ability to shape the 21st century world economy. The economic gains for a country like the UK with uh, such uh, close ties with the US are clear. More opportunities for British exporters of cars, legal services and financial services, more inwards foreign direct investments. All in all, an ambitious TTIP deal is estimated to be worth as much as uh, 10 billion pounds a year to the UK, UK economy over time. But uh, these economic gains are only part of the picture. TTIP is also about strengthening European influence in the future world economy. As I have already said, Europe on its own will be in a strong position in the future. But we will still need allies. And TTIP offers a way to secure our cooperation with the United States on very important questions. Together, we will be able to shape the rules of the future. Separately, we will undergo them. This agreement will be necess necess this agreement will ne necessarily 
have a major focus on rules and regulation. I always have it in one word in a speech. <laughs> because uh, those are the most important barriers to transatlantic trade. Finding ways to lower regulatory barriers to trade while avoiding and lowering the protection that regulation provides will not be easy. But if we are successful, the agreements we pioneer can later be applied more widely, helping from the basis for truly global rules. Those rules would have the added benefit of being based on principles not only of economic openness, but also of high standards for health, the environment, labor and consumer protection. On these questions of values, the truth is that the EU and the US share much more than we differ on. TTIP, by bringing us even closer, strengthens those shared values on the global stage. In my mind, these benefits are clear. And I also know that others have concerns about potential negative side effects. In a democracy, concerns like that are always welcome. So I would like to address three of them. First, regulation. Some people are afraid that the Americans will force us to stop protecting our environment, reduce regulation of banks, eat hormone-treated beef, and change our legislation on channels. Just to name a few. I have been very clear on this point in the past, but I would like to make it clear again. We will not be doing any of that. It is simply not going to happen. Why? Because there are ways to facilitate trade without lowering the level of protection. For example, you could eliminate unnecessary double factory inspections for pharmaceuticals, unnecessarily different car safety standards, and needless differences between how we keep track of medical devices in case of product recalls. But anyone who says TTIP is all about regulation is mistaken. TTIP will not trigger a race to the bottom. Because, as I said, by working together on these issues, the EU and the US are strengthening the chances that our high standards will be used by other countries around the world. Second, investment protection. And in particular, the uh, system known as Investor to State Dispute Settlement, recently known because six months ago nobody knew what it was about. This system allows investors to bring claims against host governments to international arbitration panels in certain cases. <coughs> this is sensitive. People are worried that this system will limit our freedom to make laws to protect our citizens or the environment. They look at uh, some of the cases that have been brought by a tobacco company against Australia, for example, and they ask why that should be possible. The jury is literally still out on these cases, but I do understand the concern. And that is why I want people's help to design our approach to this issue through a public consultation on our draft text for the negotiations. We will be launching that next month, and all European citizens will be able to give their views. But I also want to make sure that they have all the facts they should know that these agreements are not new. They have existed for 40 years. Of the 1,400, very well, 1,400 investment treaties around the world, over 80 were negotiated by the UK. Almost all other EU member states also have them. Nine of our newest member states have them in the United States already. And none of these treaties has stopped us from developing the world's highest standards in the areas of health, security, and the environment. Investment agreement also exists for a reason. The British economy benefits from the investments your companies make in other countries. And governments in those countries do sometimes threat foreign companies unfairly, putting ultimately British jobs and broader economic interests at risk. My objective for EU investment policy is to improve on these agreements. 
I want to keep the good bits that protect investments but also fix the shortcomings that have created concerns. I want to stop loopholes being used for frivolous claims and to put the arbitration system itself beyond reproach in terms of transparency and impartiality. That is why we are holding this consultation, to make sure we do this in the right way. Third, the National Health Service. Again, I want to make sure that uh, everybody understands that this agreement does not endanger the National Health Service in any way. Two concerns have been raised. The first is about rules on trade in services. We use trade agreements to create opportunities for British and European services companies, accountants, lawyers, telecom, banks and insurers. But we do not do that with public services like health because of their social role. The UK government's approach to providing health services will therefore not be affected by the TTIP negotiations on services. If member states of the European Union wants to keep certain services in the public domain, it can. However, if it wants to contract out those services to the private sector by way of a concession, we should be open to the idea that that contract may also go to an American company. The second concern is on the investment protection issues I have already been spoken about. People are worried that investment protection might limit the possibility for future UK governments to reverse decisions on privatization taken by their predecessors. However, investment protection rules do not interfere with the sovereign rights of the UK to decide how it wants to organize healthcare. The UK has been negotiating bilateral investment treaties since 1975. You have more than 80 of them, and they have not gotten in the way of UK health policy so far. That should even be less of a possibility under TTIP. The goal is to have more rather than less policy space than in previous agreements. But let's imagine a future agreement, a future government, excuse me, did choose to take some privatized services back under state control. Given the centuries-old tradition of the rule of law in this country, certain strings would be attached for such action under national law. For example, taking away private property would only be possible by following due process and paying effective compensation. Indeed, in no Western economy does the law allow expropriation of private assets without compensation. So taking anything back into public ownership always has a cost. The government would have to come to an accommodation with the private contractors, either by waiting until contracts expire, or by paying whatever compensation is required by the contract. In such a case, there would be no expropriation, no denial of justice, no arbitrary behavior by the state. And the same would be true under international arbitration. Again, the investment protection standard would not prohibit nationalization. It would only ask for effective compensation under due process of law. So also under international law, there would be no case for a company to win an arbitration case. And that is long, that is the long and the short of it, in my view. But uh, you don't have uh, to take my word for it. When we launch a public consultation, a proposed text will be on the table for all to examine. And indeed, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is because of the intensity connected and changing nature of the global economy that we need to have discussions like these. But it is only by facing up to these complex issues and by finding ways to reconcile our values and interests in a competitive world economy that we will secure our future. The European Union is the best vehicle that the UK or any of our member states have to do that. It's probably a major reason why 8 out of 10 UK companies think staying in the single market is so important. But conversely, the UK is also essential for Europe to succeed. 
We need your effective and enlightened civil servants. We need your broad-minded journalism. Most of all, we need your long tradition of open markets, from Adam Smith through the repeal of the Corn Laws to the leading role the UK plays in EU trade policy today. Remember that the oldest free trade agreement was the Methuen Treaty of 1703 between England and Portugal, named after the British ambassador to Lisbon. The response to globalization can and should involve strengthened national identities. But those identities must allow for the mutual benefits that comes from cooperation with Europe and through Europe with the wider world. Keynes lamented the, so the short-sightedness of the 1919 Versailles Treaty, asking, I quote, must we not base our actions on better expectations and believe that the prosperity and happiness of one country promotes that of others, end of quotation. The answer to that question, in my view, merely 100 years ago and today is yes. Thank you for your attention. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we now open the floor for questions, and um, depending on how many we get, I may group them in, in groups of three, but uh, when you ask your question, could you very kindly say uh, who you are? Lady right at the back. Excuse me, but I don't understand you. No, I believe you, but uh, maybe could you just come closer so that I rightly understand the question? Or shout. <laughs> shout at me, yes. Better, yeah. I can't hear very well either. Um, my name is Louise Irvin. I'm a GP in Lewisham. And I'm also standing for the National Health Action Party in the Euro elections for the London MEP elections because we're very concerned about the EU-US trade agreement and TTIP and how, what it might mean for the NHS. And although you said the investor state dispute settlement we sh um, agreements where, where companies can sue governments for loss of future profits <coughs> if they make laws, for example, to um, renationalise or to no longer have... Um, private companies running health services, and it used to be we should have nothing to worry about. But I, I can't quite believe that, because I know that other ISDS agreements uh, have affected countries like Canada, where the government has been sued successfully and been forced to reverse laws that were done to try to protect the, um, the people, um, and other places that have had to try, try to bring um, services back into public ownership have, uh, have been sued. So I'm not really reassured by what you're saying, and I would like more detail on that, please. Thank you. Can you respond to that? You want to Okay. Uh, it's, it's actually on the same theme as well. Um, my name is John Hillary. I'm the Executive Director of War on Want. Um, and actually the author of a study on TTIP published this week by the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation in Brussels. People can get it freely from their website, but I've got a printed copy for you <laughs> so you can read it on the Eurostar on the way home. Um, we also have... I cannot promise. I will read it, but whether it will be if I read back, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, we also have grave concerns around the ISDS and absolutely back up the concerns raised earlier, not just in relation to the 20-year experience of Canada, US and Mexico under NAFTA, but also the much more recent experience under bilateral investment treaties. But actually I wanted to focus a specific question, if I may, on the consultation on ISDS that you're launching next month. Um, one of the problems that we've had and one of the problems of legitimacy around the TTIP negotiations is of course the complete secrecy, the complete lack of transparency. We have the letter from the chief negotiator, Ignacio Garcia Becerro, to the assistant USTR last year, saying that all documents related to TTIP will be closed to the public for a 30-year period. And therefore, there's absolutely no way we can... I have the letter here, I can, I can hand it to you. Um, the problem for us is the devil is always in the detail for all of these trade negotiations. So my question is, what exactly will be in the ISDS text that you give out for consultation? For example, on the Canadian free trade agreement, the CETA, we already have leaked versions from November last year and February of this year 
of the investment protection chapter and the ISDS chapter. So will it be that level of detail with square brackets representing both the differences within the EU member states and the differences with the USA? Thank you. Take the lady next year and then we'll have uh, Linda Korsha, uh, Stop TTIP UK. Um, my question is in relation to, uh, to still on the NHS, my, my question is in relation to the reversals of contracting uh, in the NHS, you said that um, you can wait until the contract expires, but under general trading service liberalisation commitments, it's the liberalisation that is the commitment. So I don't understand how waiting for a contract to expire will allow um, any reversal because the commitment is the liberalisation, the staying open to uh, transnational investors, which in inherently stops uh, any uh, renationalising of contracts. This, uh, these three questions are... Uh intricate uh, mixture of politics and law. I happen to be both. I'm a lawyer and I'm a politician. Um, the first question, uh, and I understand, madam, that you are a doctor. That, that's what it is. No? Um, it, it's mostly inspired by mistrust. You don't really believe what I'm saying. Um, or at least you are very much worried about it and you think that uh, uh, the devil is in a detail you don't know. And of course you are also in a political campaign, which I applaud because uh, I'm a Democrat and I have been a, an elected politician for more than three decades. So uh, I have no problem with that. But I know that also myself, you know, in campaigns I just sometimes uh, exaggerated a little bit uh, uh, what served my purposes. Um, now, the National Health Service, there have been a number of services that have been privatized, which has been um, a decision um, by the British Parliament. Uh, has nothing to see with Europe, you know, it's, it has been a national decision to do so. And I don't even have uh, personal thoughts on that. I mean, that, that's uh, subsidiarity. That, that's up to uh, Great Britain to decide what they want to decide and also to reverse it when they want to reverse it if uh, there would be another government. I mean, uh, that's, that's not my point. Uh, now, and then I come to the last question because I, I have to connect this. Um, because you say, look, the end of the country has nothing to see with it. Of course it has to see with it. Because if you, uh, for example, give a concession to a company for a certain period of time, it's obvious that once the, the concession is over, there cannot be a claim anymore. No? And that's precisely what we want to do in this ISDS provision, make sure that the claim cannot be about the reverse uh, of policy, but about uh, possible uh, damages that uh, would result from uh, unfair and discriminatory treatment between um, British and third country, in this case, uh, US companies. That's what we want to focus on. No? So we want to preserve the policy space. And that's not always the case in the present day ISDS provisions that, by the way, have not been negotiated by uh, the European Union, but negotiated by the individual member states. And you know that. Uh, we only have this uh, competence on, uh, on investment since the Lisbon Treaty, so we only start working in that field. Uh, but the other could, could be, but we don't have an ICS provision with the United States, which by the way is true. But it doesn't mean you couldn't get uh, attacked on something like that now. Uh, that's precisely, by the way, what is happening with Australia. Uh, it's uh, Philip Morris that is attacking Australia, but they are not doing it from the headquarters, they are doing it from Hong Kong, I think, isn't it, Frank? Where they have a subsidiary, no? uh, and uh, from there they attack Australia. Now, there are a number of European member states that have ISDS provisions with the United States, 
And uh, for example, if they would like to uh, um, attack Great Britain, they could very well start from that country, have a subsidiary there, or even a, a post uh, uh, box uh, um, company, and attack Great Britain. That's perfectly possible under the present rules. It will not be possible anymore under what we have on our mind, because you could only do it from a country where you have substantial activities. Just to give you an example, that you can be attacked under the present day provisions, although you don't have an ISS provision with the US, or you could, huh? uh, and it would not be possible anymore And the uh, ISS provision we have, uh, we have in mind. Um, on the secrecy, I know this is the uh, that's what is said all the time. You know. This is the most open negotiation we have ever conducted, ever. Of course, you then you answer will be so the others were even more secret. Huh? But they are not because you have uh, full access to our documents, you know, our position papers. Uh, read the website. On the Eurostar, read it on the Eurostar. You know? <laughs> when going to Brussels and coming back, and you can go back and forth ten times and still be on that website reading documents on TTIP. It, 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 it would take you some time, you know. No documents. Excuse me? Not the negotiating documents. But, sir, I mean, we are in this process of negotiating since April. What we presently have is our position documents on the basis of which we negotiate. The second step will be what you call bracketed texts, where you have positions from both countries put together and where they do not uh, coincide, you put them between brackets. We will also make public those bracketed texts once they exist, you know. We cannot give you anything that we don't have ourselves. Once there will be bracketed texts, we will have them. And there is also an agreement with the United States that at that moment in time they will also agree to make them open. The problem that we are facing now is that the United States have a traditional opinion on what should be uh, the climate surrounding negotiations. You call it secrecy, they call it confidentiality. Uh, I'm not arguing about the words, but I cannot make public a text I got from the United States without their consent. I cannot. And I'm just coming back from the US. I have argued that they should do it because it would dissipate and, and, and uh, make away with, with, with a lot of, uh, of mistrust, but that's not their habit. And they are presently negotiating the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and they are doing it exactly in the same way. And they have promised that uh, they are going to change over time. We press them all the time on that. But don't say that the European Commission is secret on what they are doing. And the letter uh, that you are referring to with, for, for, with Ignacio, uh, that uh, documents uh, on TTIP will be secret for 30 years, uh, I, I, I have no knowledge of that text, and by the way, oh, okay, but uh, what, what, why would it be secret, you know? You know, once there is an agreement, you have the agreement. You will have the whole agreement. You, know? you will have it with the, uh, the uh, bracketed text, you will have the different versions that, that come about. Once it is, is, is established and it, it's uh, stabilized, uh, you will even have it in 23 languages, you know. It's, it's simply not true. I mean, and then you speak about leaked texts. For example, on the ISDS provision with Canada, one from November and one from uh, February. The established text with Canada will be in the annex of the public consultation. And that's not leaked, that's made public. So I, don't talk to me about leaked texts, you know, because this seems to be, uh, uh, this is the, the new feature in town, leaked text on the internet. I'm not Snowden. Huh? Uh, so you will have uh, the, the text of, of the IATS provision with Canada, and I think it, it remedies all the uh, deficiencies on the existing IATS provisions that I know. And if as a result of public consultations others come to the fore, we will take uh, that into account. We do the public consultation not in the general way as it already happened by the start of the negotiation. <coughs> we will have a focused one and everybody will be fully informed uh, on what it is about. And then you won't need text anymore, you won't 
need secret documents anymore, just read what we produce. Okay, let's move on to the next group of questions, sir. Thank you. Um, I'm Simon Renton, I uh, teach history at UCL, but I'm here representing UCU, which is a trade union which organises workers in the university and college sectors. Um, so I'll come to you, education, in just a moment. I just wanted to uh, say, to start with, that I quite understand um, your anxiety about the apparent lack of trust. But, to be honest, I think the slightly Jesuitical approach that you've taken in, in, in response to this is all secret, to say we're not offending against democracy by being secret as much as we used to is not a a great defence. But I'd like to move on to um, questions of those sectors which might reasonably be excluded from op being opened to international competition and to direct threats of privatisation. And of course, you have said, whether correctly or not, that the NHS is excluded. I'd like to move on then to, I suppose, uh, education across the board, because it appears that those parts which have already, either in their entirety or in part, been privatised, would be vulnerable to protection in that kind of way, um, uh, or could be, but uh, the point there, of course, is that the, the big issue is that it seems that public services of all sorts ought to be under some kind of democratic control by the populations that they uh, cater to, but the whole idea of ISDS will mean, does mean, where it's occurred elsewhere, that the disputes over those issues are removed from the power of the domestic courts or even normal international courts and are put in the power of corporate lawyers operating effectively in secret and often against the stated wishes of domestic electorates. The example I would immediately no, 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 come up with... Sorry, we'll, we'll, we'll have a, have a lot OK, of fair enough. Sure OK. Um, Hi, um, I'm a student here at UCL. I study law. And I was just wondering, um, with something that hasn't been touched on so much, with um, not with regard to the investor state dispute settlement, but rather with regard to the different regulatory standards and especially approaches in the US and the EU, and um, whether you could tell us a bit how that's working out, for example, with, um, the, I, I don't know, Syngenta herbicide Adrazine, that um, the EU takes usually a very cautious and there might be a risk, so we're not going to allow it approach, whereas the um, FDA approach in the US is unless it's proven that it's harmful, and correct me if I'm wrong, we're going to allow it. So th those are very different approaches that on GMO, um, lots of herbicides and pesticides, lots of things have produced very different results. And um, <coughs> I was wondering whether you could tell us how you're trying to accommodate that in the agreement. That would be very interesting. One more question for Ms. Brown. Yes. Hello. Um, uh, I'll ask a very different comment there. Um, my question is just a follow-up question on the question of the investor state disputes uh, settlement procedure consultation that's coming up. Um, and uh, my question is, uh, will the Commission actually be considering the question of whether investor state disputes are going to be included in the agreement, or is the consultation only focusing on the details of that procedure? So it, it, it is, it, is there any possibility now of persuading the Commission that uh, we should do away with the procedure completely, or are we now just looking at the detail of the procedure? Professor, we are not going to privatize uh, education. We are not. Uh, and we are not even discussing that. Uh, of course, there are some activities that you could associate with education that, that happen transatlantically and that also happen uh, on, on a private basis. But uh, uh, you should also not forbid that. Uh, we have all kinds of managerial courses and, and you name it. I mean. Uh, so the, 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 the existing practice, we are not going to forbid it, but this treaty is, is not at all about education. And uh, to the extent that it is in a 
public service uh, uh, is completely out of the orbit of these negotiations, completely. And the same goes, by the way, for the, uh, the public services uh, uh, at, at large. Um, we have made very clear to the U.S. that we want this exception for public services. But we have to be clear about this. Uh, when, for example, a public service uh, um, is uh, done by a concession for a limited period of time, then I see no reason why there would be an ab initio discrimination between a European or an American company. That, of course, that American company as well as the European company would be subject to the legislation, obviously so. And that's what we then would call uh, national treatment, but that's has nothing to see with privatization of public, uh, of public services. Um, on, the, on the secrets, I think, uh, and I've been saying what, the, what, what I think about that. Um, you know, my goal, which is to make an agreement with you, yes, is best served by as much transparency as possible. I have no problem with that at all. And uh, I'm known a little bit uh, uh, to say what I'm thinking on most of what is happening in the world, even on too much. And my ambassador, uh, when I was a minister, of course, is not my ambassador anymore. But, uh, uh, Guido trouber can, can, I think, uh, testify that. He was a uh, director for Africa when I was a minister of foreign affairs. And I was a pain in the ass. Huh? <laughs> but I'm still convinced that I was correct. Um, now, the second question that was put was uh, um, by, by you, uh, sir, it's on the precautionary principle. That's what you mentioned, no? That's what you tried to mention. Okay. Yes, the precautionary uh, principle, no? Yes. That's what it is, huh? Yes, uh, we have the precautionary principle, and uh, the Americans are less risk averse. That's, that's a cultural difference between us, and that's a cultural difference we are not going to bridge in this agreement. So the Americans would certainly like to have a system whereby once there is uh, scientific evidence that automatically this would uh, result in an authorization. We don't have that system, and we are not going to change that system. Uh, of course, we should also not put aside scientific results. That wouldn't make sense either. But we will uh, continue to live with the proportionate principle as it, uh, uh, well, as, as it uh, is translated in, in, in numerous directives and, and, and regulations. And that will continue to be the case. On the other hand, we have also to observe our own legislation. <coughs> so, um, recently, uh, we have been condemned by the European Court of Justice on, a, on, a, on three GMOs because we, it took us more than 10 years to take a decision because we were simply putting it in the, the, in, in the, in the frigo, you know? That, 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 that's not the idea either. Huh? We have to take a decision, positive or negative, and if it is negative, then people and companies should have the possibility to go to the European Court of Justice because we are governed by the rule of law. That we should also do. But the precautionary principle will not be uh, changed. And then the last question uh, by uh, you, madam, on uh, uh, making away completely with the uh, ISDS, and that, that's, uh, if that is an option. Um, first of all, one should not forget that over the last 24 months, the majority of all ISDS cases launched have been launched by EU companies, 52% of all uh, the ISDS cases in the world have been launched by European companies, so it, it means that European companies are of the opinion that this has some interest. No? Uh, secondly, uh, even if you were to do that in, in this treaty, it would not avoid that you get attacked from somewhere else. Uh, and thirdly, uh, I don't think that the US would agree about it. And if you don't uh, get to a modern uh, uh, agreement, let's say, on ISDS, and that's the one we are going to consult you about, the existing agreements would remain in force. They would not automatically disappear. They would remain in force. So unless we uh, replace them by something else, uh, we would continue to live uh, in the somewhat uh, uncertain uh, ISDS uh, environment, which is the result of the past. 
the parts where people didn't ask the questions they are putting now, you know. Uh, all this uh, discussion comes from this uh, case of Philip Morris against Australia. That, that's why it, it has, uh, that's where it has originated. Take the enlargement of the European Union. Um, that it's about the, 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 uh, the biggest use of policy space you can imagine by those countries because they have to completely change their legislation, completely. They, they had to uh, uh, take over the acquis communautaire and, and it, it meant that uh, uh, they had to uh, change 90% uh, of their trade legislation and then uh, uh, health and safety provisions, uh, SPS, you name it, you know. There has never been a case against those countries, you know, by no company in the whole process, never. Uh, it was mentioned Canada. Now, the uh, experience with Canada and with NAFTA is that it never made any problem. Huh? That, that, that's, that's, a, that's a situation. Huh? So, uh, uh, we, we shouldn't, uh, we, I think we should be very careful about this. And uh, I, I, I believe that this uh, public consultation that, by the way, I decided myself to launch. Uh, it, has been, it hasn't been asked by any member state. They simply took the decision to do it. It will be enlightening us. I'm, I'm sure about that, but on the other hand, we should not uh, uh, take decisions uh, before the consultation either. More questions? Sir. Uh, Raja, King's College London. This is just a general question, general question concerning the direction of due trade policy. Uh, before 2006, the EU had imposed a moratorium on selling DAs. Before 2006, you had imposed an inform informal moratorium <coughs> on the conclusion of free trade agreements. After 2006, it targeted emerging economies, Mercosur, India, ASEAN. Uh, one of the major points of these free trade agreements uh, with emerging economies was that these countries were the real leaders to the opposition uh, in the Doha round negotiations. And if you could get an agreement with those countries, then maybe that could serve as a basis for multilateral trade uh, negotiations. Uh, now, the EU is increasingly signing free trade agreements with large trading nations, developed countries, US, Japan, and Canada. Uh, so, does this mean that the EU is uh, giving up on uh, the multilateral trade vision, notwithstanding the recent uh, Bali package, that the EU is increasingly uh, wanting to negotiate uh, free trade agreements with like minded countries where it can shape uh, global rules, as you admitted, and then export them to other countries? Thank you. Rafael Lear from ITJA, Queen Mary, University of London. I wanted to ask you your views on the impact that US, the US uh, shale gas revolution may have on EU energy security. Oh, shale gas. Shale gas, the revolution of the US shale gas currently taking place in the United States. How that may impact EU energy security and whether you think that the current negotiation may enhance um, EU energy security. Uh, yes, Simon Courtney, I'm a, a fund manager actually, I'm a member of the UCL alumnus. Um, actually, a related question. As I understand it, the, the US has a moratorium on the, on, on the export of oil products. You can export gas, although there's no infrastructure but not oil, for strategic reasons. Um, would that be likely to be liberalised under this TTIP agreement? Is that something you're negotiating? <coughs> Okay, um, first question on, on the, uh, uh, whether we, we, uh, we are leaving the uh, multilateral approach, uh, that, that's, that's what uh, your question is. Um, and I, I agree that uh, the, uh, the agreement that we made in Bali is a very important agreement, but the other hand is not the core of the Doha round. But it's an important agreement. Um, the core of the Doha round, it's, uh, it's, it's the tariffs on, on the, uh, industrial products, uh, agriculture, and uh, uh, services liberalization. That, that's the core, and that's, that's where it is stuck. Now, we should ask ourselves uh, why it is stuck. It's certainly not because of the position of the European Union, but the paradigm that lies um, at the origin of the Doha round, it's the paradigm of asymmetry, whereby 
LDCs, least developed countries, have to make less efforts than the developing countries, those less than the emerging economies, and the emerging economies less than the mature economies. That's the paradigm of Doha, a symmetry. Now, uh, the negotiations on, on, on um, Doha go back uh, for more than a decade. They started more than a decade ago. And the problem is that paradigm has changed, and that the emerging economies, and especially China, has emerged. That's the real problem. And the reaction is then to say, now they should make the same efforts as we do. And there is, are a lot of reasons to, to, to say so. Nevertheless, Europe has tried uh, to uh, make compromises because we realize that, for example, China is not uh, going to agree on that anytime soon. <coughs> so we have been making, uh, it's just two years ago because it was the beginning of uh, 2012, what they call sector proposals on uh, chemicals, on uh, machinery, and on microelectronics. Whereby we were, uh, emerging economies would make an effort of 50% and ours of 66%. And nevertheless, we did not reach an agreement, and we were not followed neither by China nor by the United States, because they are of the opinion that it should be exactly the same, and for the Chinese, exactly the same. It means Doha, and for the United States, it means the same effort by everybody. That's where the multilateral negotiations are stuck. Now, we happen to be the biggest trading force in the world. And by the way, taking together also the biggest economy in the world. Uh, we cannot abstain from new evolutions. We cannot do that. And that's the reason why, by the way, in my mission st statement uh, now, four years ago, it was stated explicitly that we should uh, have this network of uh, bilateral agreements um, that had already started that evolution, but uh, it certainly has now been amplified. Does it uh, obstruct in itself further evolution on the multilateral level? It does not. Because, for example, what we are negotiating in TTIP it's almost 100% DOA plus what we try to do on services, on public procurement, and certainly on the regulatory. I mean, you could never negotiate that in, 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 uh, in, the, in the WTO, never. Uh, and uh, I believe that by lifting this ceiling, that's what we are actually doing, because we only make very ambitious agreements, we also create more space to lift the floor. That's, that will happen, you know, it will happen. Not today, not tomorrow, but it will happen. For a number of reasons. Because uh, the rest of the world will realize that this is the only good response. Uh, secondly, because managing a complex network of bilateral agreements is not easy and cannot be done even by middle-sized countries. It can only be done by big economic blocks like the, the EU or the US. So it, it, it will happen, but it okay, we will have to wait some time for further uh, dramatic evolutions at the multilateral level that I would certainly applaud, you know. Uh, we have been making numerous proposals. For example, we are ready to multilateralize everything but arms. We are ready to do so. And by the way, we already do it now. We give uh, everything but arms, which means that uh, least developed countries can export uh, everything duty-free quota fee into the European market. We, uh, on ourselves, we have given it to all countries in that same uh, category, not only in, 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 uh, in Africa, but also in Asia, like to, to Bangladesh or, or, or Myanmar. They, they are not doing it in the US. Agoa is, is, is selective. It's not 100% and it's selective on the, on the countries that they give access uh, uh, to, to Agoa. So we are ready to do that. We have no problem. And I could give you a lot of other, pro uh, a lot of, of, of other uh, uh, examples that uh, we have now very recently been making an agreement with ECOWAS, the West African countries, uh, ranging from Nigeria to, to Mali. And in that agreement there will explicitly be that we are not any longer going to give any export subsidy uh, when we export uh, um, uh, agricultural products to those countries. We are ready to multilateralize it in a bigger context. We are ready to do so. So we are certainly not the ones that uh, uh, are upholding 
the multilateral negotiations, uh, it's exactly the opposite, by the way. On shale gas uh, and the moratorium, uh, notice in the American legislation is they can only export uh, energy products and in first instance, of course, shale gas, that's what it is about, to countries they have a free trade agreement with. That's what is in their legislation, which is an, another reason to have a free trade agreement with them. Uh, although, I mean, I cannot see that the United States would prohibit exports of shale gas uh, to Europe if they export it to anybody else. You know. But it is important to have a good agreement on that in the, uh, in, in, in the uh, TTIP uh, uh, agreement, if it is to come about, because you also have to establish the uh, physical conditions for doing that. For example, you need uh, um, uh, terminals. Uh, you cannot uh, transport uh, shale gas uh, as you do it with steel, for example. You need uh, terminals to liquefy and the, uh, gasify it against. Uh, so you also want to create the physical conditions and uh, the transparency and, and so on and so on. So that will be an important part of the, of the negotiation. Um, and now we should, uh, of course, realize that when you export shale gas from the US to Europe, uh, largely, it will mean that you pay double the price because uh, uh, transporting uh, LNG is, 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 is expensive. It's an expensive uh, business. So the only solution for Europe does not lie in, uh, in shale gas, I think, shale gas importing from the US, but a combination of measures, uh, uh, I mean, I'm not going to dwell upon that now, but uh, it, it, that's only part of the puzzle. But it's, uh, it, it's effectively part of that puzzle that we are discussing in the in the agreements with the US. Yes. Is that also a question, an answer to your question? Well, my, my question was specifically about uh, the export of oil. I mean, I mean there's the similar challenges in that there's no infrastructure to actually do that at the moment. But um, obviously, you have you have lower energy prices generally, obviously, mostly because of gas, but also because of oil, um, because you can't export oil per se. From the U.S., I understand. I mean, from what you just said, it sounds like you have a different understanding of that. But I have an understanding how your transport is. Yes. Yeah. For strategic reasons, the Americans want to keep their oil on shore. Um, is that going to be liberalised as, as part of this agreement? Was my question. That's what I'm saying. That uh, they can do it, provided that you have a free trade agreement with them, and there will be a chapter on that in the agreement. Yes. Right. Obviously so, but uh, I mean, uh, I think the uh, where, where they will have an excess production is in shale gas, you know, much more than in oil, because the additional gas exploration uh, there comes always water, gas, and oil together, which is not the case with shale gas. Somewhat different. So, that, but that that's a whole discussion on the energy market that that will, could lead us very far. Uh, because I believe that the part of the puzzle is also in, 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 in Russia, in, in, in uh, pipeline, uh, diversification in Iran, for example. So there is a, it's a somewhat more complicated landscape than only the U.S. But yes, we are going to tackle this problem uh, in detail with the U.S. I think we've got uh, time for one quick round of, of questions. So if, if anybody else has a, a question to ask, uh, a lady there. Yes, ma'am. Can you please tell me a little really don't understand? My name is Laurence Dubois d'Estrizet for the French Embassy. Uh, my question would be on financial services. Are they going to be in the scope of the agreement? You mentioned on investment that the US will not accept an agreement without uh, the investment clause. Do you think it is possible for the EU not to accept an agreement with financial services in? What do the Americans not accept? So no, no agreement which doesn't have investment in it. Could we accept an agreement that didn't have, could we insist on an agreement that didn't have financial services? Uh, lady there. So, uh, my name is Jiang <laughs> from China. Um, my interest is uh, about the uh, deep trail genders uh, between the FTAs and also. Come here um, because I. I, I come here, sorry, come up, come up. 
Thank you. Um, my name is Yue Jiang. I'm from China. Uh, my interest is basically about the world trade genders and also uh, the US and EU FTA is about the deep trade concerns, for example, the trade and investment concerns and also non-trade concerns like the environmental or labor rights concerns. And you have mentioned the uh, transatlantic um, partnership uh, in negotiation and what do you think is the uh, incentive for the two trade um, two traders of the world to come together and negotiate and have a successful outcome because we have known this kind of negotiation have been keeping on for decades and what is new incentive in this contest in this environment uh, to make the progress and also um, how do you see I'm going to hold you there because we've got very little time and I want to gentleman in the middle thank there you. thank you uh, Grace Bridges, University of Essex. Um, I'm trying to bring this back slightly to the Brussels politics um, going on. Of course, the European Parliament and European Commission are due to be reselected before the end of this year. I'm wondering uh, three questions. First, um, how, Can you make it one question? Well, how, how, quick, uh, uh, how far do you think negotiations will go before the Commission is reselected? How? How far will negotiations go? Secondly, do you have any advice for the, uh, your successor in the trade, as a trade commissioner? And thirdly, um, <laughs> what advice would you give? Advice for the successor. Trade commissioner. And thirdly, and regarding the European Parliament elections, as the European Parliament under Lisbon now, I think, has a same procedure on the trade bills. Um, unfortunately, um, the LSC has just done a, a poll in 28 countries, and uh, it reckons that. Eurosceptics will end up with 30% of the seats. Do you foresee any problems in ratification from the European Parliament that's sceptical to Europe? Um, we um, will discuss financial services with them. Uh, I've never heard of this uh, red line on investment, uh, honestly speaking. Uh, it has never been mentioned to me in any case. And Sorry, I didn't... What I said is that you said on investment that it would be difficult because the, U the, 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 the U.S. Uh, will not accept an agreement without the, the, the government's investment mechanism. So my question was yeah, yeah, I on, financial I service, your question. On, on financial services where apparently the U.S. are very reluctant. No, but what, I, what I want to say is that uh, this has never been said that to them this is a red line but because it simply has never been discussed in, in those terms. That's what I want to say. Uh, on the financial services, yes, we want financial services to be uh, discussed, and I think for a good reason, because uh, they reply to say, look, uh, we have uh, uh, provisions and, and the principles agreed in, in G8, the G20, Basel Committee, and so on, and that's enough. That's not true. Uh, the problem is, once you want to implement those principles, that you see very big divergences between the EU and the US and the recent example of derivatives is proving this. There was an agreement on derivatives with the US between uh, Michel Barnier and, uh, and the US and uh, once they had to uh, translate it into actual regulation even though there was an, 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 an a very detailed agreement uh, a, a number of discrepancies uh, uh, appeared and now they have to sit again around the table so that's I think a very good proof of that. They are reluctant, yes, okay, we are also reluctant on a number of issues, but uh, we will continue to press for that. Um, I think the question for What is the reason that there are so many uh, new initiatives? Uh, why, uh, why now? Uh, why have you failed for so long? Why now? Um, I think it, it has uh, to see with the number of evolutions I mentioned uh, uh, into the multilateral uh, uh, environment, but there is also uh, the globalization that has to be matched uh, by a new legislative uh, framework. That's, uh, that's another, uh, you call it incentive, I would say driver for these uh, kind of negotiations. And uh, for, take your country, we are, have opened uh, investment negotiations uh, uh, with China. Uh, uh, not only on investment protection but also on market access. Why? Because we want market access. 
and uh, because the Chinese want to have a better protection for their investments in Europe because they are interested in investing in Europe. So that, that's the reason you, you, you make the, the, the legal framework and, and the, the treaty framework for new developments in the, uh, in the economy and in this case globalization. Um, where will we be at the end of the mandate? Um, we are continuing to work uh, full steam even in a higher gear, but physically it's not possible to do all this before the end of the year. Physically it's simply not possible, for a number of reasons. Um, um, but I hope that by the end of the mandate we uh, can have a, a broad understanding on, on, on a, a, number of, a number of issues, and that's towards what we are working. Um, uh, my advice to my successor, I don't know yet who will be my successor, so the advice could be different whether it's myself or somebody else. <laughs> um, and uh, your last one was, uh, you were skeptic, no? I, I, uh, the, the, no, you were not, but uh, you think that there will be more uh, skeptic uh, members in the European Parliament? Could very well be. Uh, but uh, overall, there is an, uh, a positive uh, climate uh, uh, on trade in the European Parliament. And uh, um, in these skeptics, you have a, a number of people who are in fact against globalization, against trade, and they will continue to be against trade. Uh, you have others who uh, could only agree uh, on Europe when it was with respect to trade. You also have that, by the way, in your own country. Uh, so um, I don't think it will really influence uh, that much. It could change the nature of relationship between the Commission and Parliament. I think uh, you could very well uh, go in the direction of a much more continental approach of, of, a, uh, of, a, of an, uh, a commission that uh, uh, where the majority of the, of the commission uh, uh, is the result of a majority in parliament and vice versa. That you could have. I mean, that's an interesting evolution, but we don't have time to uh, uh, dwell on, on that uh, today. But spe specifically on trade, I'm not sure that this would make a big difference. Well, I guess... Uh Commissioner, if you, if you uh, rashly agree to give a lecture to a, a law faculty, you're opening yourself to cross-examination. Uh, and I think you had a very rigorous uh, cross-examination, but thank you for responding yourself with such rigor and vigor. And I think it's been both an intellectual and a political uh, treat. So thank you very much indeed. For <laughs>